shown to take pretty much everything I do pretty seriously. And uh, some people make fun of me for it, but uh, I thought you guys might benefit from a little bit of that. So uh, let's let's jump right in. If you would like, you can just pull down this repo, hit this slash slides.html, and follow along. Um, and it should work as long as you pull down the entire repo because everything is local. All right, so why take it seriously? Well, you know, I do that naturally, but um, there's some reasons for you guys to start doing it too. First, um, you're writing more code in JavaScript at this point. I think it's pretty clear that you guys care about JavaScript. You're being asked to write more, more interactivity on the web, and um, more complex experiences on the web. There's some pretty complex libraries out there. Um, so, uh, the reason that I, I wanted to give this talk is because I'm pretty sure you do a lot of good things when you're writing your server code. And I think this audience in particular is very serious about its server code. You care about design patterns, you care about architecture, you care about doing things right. So, uh, let's do some participation. How many of you do unit testing on your server code today? Raise your hand if you do that. If you don't, if you're not raising your hand, like, I don't know if I can be friends with you anymore. That's lame. Come on. It's probably going to get more serious from here. You do integration or acceptance testing for your server code. So that means the entire stack is running roughly. You're doing testing end to end. Okay? I'm worried that you're not raising your hands. Why aren't you doing that? How many people uh, measure code coverage on your server side code? Oh my god, you guys are taking your server side code very seriously. Okay. Uh, static analysis tools on your server side code. Wow, all right. Um, how many of you run continuous integration servers on your server side code? Okay, some people do that. Um, how many people use dependency injection to help make your server side code more testable? No, okay, all right. How many people uh, use a service locator pattern? Like they're that intense that they're using some sort of service provider to give them instances of classes, that kind of stuff on their server side? No. Okay, so some people, all right, let's just get let's get how many people do that in JavaScript? <laughs> Any of those things. All right, so somebody is raising their hand. I want to hear your setup. Um, in the front here, what well, is your setup? I, I cheat. I'm actually using shared code that's Java that's being generated in Java. Okay, so that's one approach. So we have somebody who is generating JavaScript from Java, which means that they can test their Java pretty well. Okay, so somebody else who is raising their hand with a pretty serious frame uh, setup for their front end code. Uh, we have a hand in the blue shirt over here. Yeah, so we use uh, Q unit tests along with the stuff in our CFI, in our TFS CI server. Okay. Um, okay, so TFS is the yeah. server that you're running. We're also yeah. cheating a bit by generating it from C sharp code, but we're actually <laughs> testing. We're actually testing both things, the C sharp code and the JavaScript. Okay, so somebody who is not generating <laughs> JavaScript code, so we're generating <laughs> JavaScript from Java and generating JavaScript from C sharp. So anybody else? Yeah. Just regular straight JavaScript. Yes. Yeah. Okay, JS Lint. So that we have a good tool. Yeah, we're doing something. Time, almost every time. I, I, I'm a big supporter of JS Lint. There's, there's been a tool release since then, which we'll talk about. We have Blue in the front here. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, a lot of partitioning with like complexity, trying to separate that out and then test with Mozilla. Okay, so we're or whatever, so whatever, it sounds whatever like, people like. Yeah, it sounds like you're breaking your JavaScript up into yeah. smaller components and testing that. Okay, so. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of hands raised for the things I expected to see at the Seattle Software Craftsmanship Meetup. So um, <laughs> let's dig in with JavaScript. You may not even do, be doing this for your server uh, code, but um, if you're doing Node.js, then you can just apply this to your server too. Um, let's dig in. So first of all, let's talk about some basic tools. Nobody writes straight JavaScript. So who uses jQuery? Why are you not using jQuery? <laughs> what are you using instead? Whatever. Okay, so that's an easy one. Um, Lodash or underscore. Um, anybody using these? Raise your hands if you use these. Okay, these are extremely effective tools. So um, this is the first of many slides that I'll do this with. Um, hopefully you can kind of see this. Um, so I'm going to run that code on the left. So what you see is uh, a reject, which is essentially an, an opposite of a filter function, run over an array, and then. Uh, we do an intersection of two arrays. So um, that gives you what you would expect, right? So for the first one, we're rejecting everything over three. And for the second one, we're um, just taking the, the two arrays and combining them. And so if you write Ruby code today, you're probably used to this kind of syntax. It's a little bit more declarative, um, a little less imperative, kind of nice. But if you're a serious JavaScript programmer and you're not using one of these two libraries, um, I don't consider you a serious 
JavaScript program. That's, that's how that <laughs> world works. So um, this is the beginning of many things like this. So let's jump in. Um, how many people are using some sort of MVC or model view, view model framework on the client side? So Backbone, Ember, Angular. OK, smattering. Um, I would uh, recommend that you do something in this space simply because it helps you organize your code better. And there are a lot of options. Um, if you want a side-by-side -side comparison for an admittedly pretty toy app, I'd recommend that you get to mbc.com. If you're not using one of these frameworks, check it out. Like People are doing some very interesting things to better organize that interactive code that you have to have on the client side these days. Um, so let's just talk about open source a little bit. We just saw an example of how many options there are in the open source world. Um, I heard Java and C Sharp, and uh, there's also the iOS world. Um, they're a bit of a walled garden. Um, so on the left, you're going to see what those of you who have a heavyweight IDE are used to, and on the right, you're going to see what um, those of us in the open source world are using, right? So instead of an IDE, you have something like Sublime Text or TextMate. You have many options with separate communities, and you're hosting your source on GitHub. You know, you have access to the source, and so some people have really tried to make it readable by putting a lot of comments in there. And so the first thing you have to realize when you're in the JavaScript world is you are in the open source world. Um, I know there are a lot of people from Microsoft here. Uh, I can't say that Microsoft is really pushing um, the library side of JavaScript very far. I haven't seen too many libraries released in JavaScript from Microsoft, really. So all the action is happening in the open source world. So I would recommend that you get used to it. Um, and so the first part of that is understanding how to choose an open source project. So this may be just basic stuff for you guys, but I think it's worth talking about, at least briefly. Um, a good open source project is going to be used by a lot of people. It's going to be active. It's going to be releasing frequently. Anything that happens out there in the world that maybe causes their approach to be now wrong, you want to see them responding to that, right? Um, and on GitHub, it makes it really easy to see what that looks like. So spin.js is a great library to help you um, generate a spinner without using an image. And that allows you to make it responsive, right? It can be the size of the text. It's pretty awesome. Um, you'll note that it has 5,400 people starring it, which is not something you have to do to use it. No, it's something that people, these people want to like be notified when anything changes in the source repository, right? That's what the, this kind of thing. Um, so that's an example of a, of a project that you probably want to use. Uh, this is one of mine. Um, it's forked from somebody else, and I don't expect other people to use it really, but um, it has one star, and um, it's just not something that you want. What's that? Is that your mom's one star? No, I, no, that's somebody else. Like, seriously, that's somebody else. I don't think I'm connected to the web, so I can't prove that. It makes you star your own repos. What's that? It makes you star your own repos. No, that is somebody else. I didn't start it. <laughs> I checked it today. I checked it today. Come on, guys. Come on. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> The, the biggest difference, of course, is simply that you can actually change these things. GitHub is great. You can fork, you can fix it, and then you can contribute back. It's pretty awesome. Having done that myself, it uh, fills me with all sorts of warm fuzziness, even though I'm all serious. Um, so there's some other libraries that I use, right? Time zone JS, because time zones are not supported natively in JavaScript. EasyXDM is pretty awesome if you're doing things like bookmarklets. Um, Spin.js, we just talked about. Um, D3.js is just sexy, right? Um, SVG, interactivity, animations, data, visualization. I don't know, I geek out about that stuff too, so it's pretty awesome. And then Socket.io is pretty awesome too. Um, that plugs into Node.js, but graceful degradation, um, real-time stuff. So when you're using all these libraries, like how do you deal with that, right? So the first step of getting serious with JavaScript is how do you manage those all those libraries, right? You can't just go to the web and hit save as and put it in your repository all the time. That just doesn't make sense. So um, Bower and NPM. Like, you can actually use both of these for client-side development. NPM can pull down things that can be used in the client side. There are a lot of libraries that are like that. And then Bower is one that's been introduced uh, more recently from, uh, than NPM, and also a very, very good tool. Um, one of the problems with Bower, however, is that some of, the time, some of the time it brings down things that you cannot use out of the box. You have to build it first, right? Because it's kind of a raw repo. And that's one, one weakness of Bower. But one of the great things about it is that it will pull down dependencies for a given um, library. Uh, Bower will, and NPM will definitely do that as well. And um, 
Bower is also set up to tell you if there are updates to a given library, right? All I have to do is... Is Bower just for JavaScript or is it for other things? Uh, it is a super abstract, high-level um, tool, actually. And so um, you connect it to a GitHub repository and put a bower.json in that project, and it does stuff, right? Oh, so it's helpful with uh, uh, GYP and Ninja Build and those kinds of things. Um, you could, I would recommend that you try it, because I'm, I'm pretty sure it would work for that, right? But um, those, those of us who use Bower for client-side JavaScript might get frustrated when we see something that looks interesting, and it's not useful to us. But in any case, um, dependency management, definitely jump into these things. Um, question? Yeah. So one struggle that I've had with both of those package managers is that, like, we have, say, Sugar or Lodash or any other ones that provide custom build um, tooling, like, they don't include it in like, whatever you're pulling down. Right, right. So that's, like, if you're going to have, like, a build process that does a custom build, you know, like, right. and, and so that's a, that's a great point. Um, custom builds are great if you want to review size or you have a specific requirement for the kind of thing you want to do. Um, in that case, I recommend you simply clone the thing and start writing some of your own scripts, right? Um, yeah, but great point. Um, it's worth doing if you have those kinds of requirements. So, um, now that we're in the world of managing your dependencies, we have to understand semantic versioning a little bit, right? Because people use this to mean things, right? It gets serious. So. Um, major versions, they are for breaking changes. Minor versions are for addition of features and only additive things, right? And then your um, patch version is for bug fixes alone. Um, and, and this, you know, if you break this, like, I will break your leg, right? Like, do not do this. Like, do not, do not break this system, okay? Now, um, it, it, it makes sense, right? Because you're using these dependencies, you have to know what's coming down when a version over changes, right? Now, the one thing I will warn you about is if you're below 1.0, like kind of all bets are off and you should watch yourself. Um, I've seen a number of breaking changes happen uh, below 1.0 and like, you know, if you're using the semantic versioning um, system below 1.0 and you're expecting that kind of stuff, like it's not gonna work for you. So um, the reason you need to know this is because in Bower and in NPM and these other systems, you can specify the version number that you want. Right? And it will pull down whatever matches that. That's why it's important to know. Uh, and then lastly, if you're going to get really serious about uh, managing your dependencies, there's something called NPM shrink wrap, where you can say, I have this hierarchy of node modules that I want to use, and I want it to be exactly the same when I use it in the future. And you can then submit that to your production <coughs> server, fully tested, and there's no worry that something will change out from under you. Imagine if you're using 1.x of a given library and you do want it to upgrade whenever um, it upgrades. If you haven't tested that, you probably don't want it to go out the door, and so shrink wrap can help you with those problems. Okay, so now that we've dealt with the library problem, let's go back to our project. Um, but we're TBD, right? I mean, this is uh, Seattle Software Craftsmanship. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So uh, let's set up a test harness. Mocha is a great tool to help you write unit tests. Um, apologies for the lack of syntax highlighting here. But um, it's pretty simple. Describe gives you a suite of, of tests. It gives you a test, and you can run before and after um, tasks before every suite or before every, um, uh, yeah, before every suite. So these before and before each would run for everything that's inside this describe. And um, you can also support async, right, which is pretty important in the JavaScript world. You can actually even use this to do something that pulls things off the internet, right? So when you uh, have a done parameter or when you, the arity of your function goes above one, that's when it's an async uh, event in the Mocha world. And so you'll have to call done for that to not time out, right? So that's Mocha, very useful little tool. Chai is another great tool if you're in the um, uh, Rails world and you're using those kind of interesting fluid assertion um, syntax techniques, then this will be really natural to you. So, um, you know, like that's not going to run anything because nothing failed, but we can do something like this. Um, so, we get nice expected this to equal this messages when these things fail, and then that's reported by your test runner. So, pretty useful little tool. Did Question? you just run code in your slide? I did. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about that? <laughs> uh, all right, so let's move on. 
Um, <laughs> so Sinon is another awesome tool for uh, mocking and spies, right? So say you go out to the web for one of your, um, your classes, it pulls something down. You don't want to have to do that during your unit tests, and so you can very easily replace that with a Sinon mock, or a Sinon stub as it calls it, and it will replace what that um, sends back to you. Um, you can also do it with things like string.prototype. You can change to uppercase. And so just run this, make sure that that works. Okay, so we don't get any results, but you know, let's just make sure that this thing would fail if it didn't work. Okay, yeah, so that didn't pass when we changed that. So what we're doing is we are actually replacing the function on string.prototype for two uppercase, which means that we will know when that thing is called. Um, and the the original um, function will actually still be called. So um, you can do that. You can actually replace it if you want, but this is just spying on it, so we know what it's called. And then we replace it back to what it was before. So um, yeah, Sinon is an extremely useful tool. If you've ever done something like, uh, I don't know, back in my C Sharp days, Rhino Mock was a pretty cool tool. That was a, that was a while ago. But um, yeah, like it's useful for um, replacing things so that you can actually um, test without hitting the web. And if you want to get really serious with Sinon, it can actually turn your entire browser into a sandbox. It stops time, and you can, uh, at a very low level, replace all um, data coming back from a given URL endpoint with what you want it to be. And so you don't actually have to replace any of your functions. It just does it at a very low level. Uh, blanket, um, super kick-ass. Like, I'm, I'm actually really stoked about this one. Um, because I used to do code coverage by using a tool called JS coverage. And the way that it did code coverage was you had to do an initial um, instrumentation step where it would change your source code and keep track of every line of code being run with its own. I mean, that's how um, JavaScript code coverage is done. But in this case, all you have to do is that. On the client side, you just include it, and then you put a, um, a little bit of uh, a little breadcrumb for a blanket to tell it what it should then uh, instrument. And on the Node.js side, when you're running your Mocha, you just put require blanket on the command line and then tell it what directories you want it to look for and, and uh, then cover. And then the result of that will be code coverage. Um, yeah, I don't think we have time to demo all these techniques because there's a huge amount of content in this. So let's continue. Uh, Phantom.js is a super cool library which will allow you to run WebKit headless. And not only will it allow you to run that stuff um, on the command line, it will allow you to uh, capture screenshots from that page that you're on, and allow you to interact with the web page like a <coughs> user by clicking buttons and such. And it's not perfect, but um, it does a lot of great stuff for you. And, and uh, it will um, take a lot of the um, worry away when you're talking about client-side testing. For that stuff, you can't really unit test very well, that there's interaction required, you can use stuff like this. Well, actually, before we do that, any questions about all those tools I just jammed in your head? No? Okay. So let's round that. So now we have our test harness. There are a few things we need to do to, um, to make sure this thing can be maintained, right? So documentation. Documentation is pretty important, right? Um, this is a tool called Grok. And this is some of my code that I've written recently. Um, what it will do is it will generate a syntax highlighted uh, bit of source, or your source, and then it will intersperse your markdown comments on the left side. And um, it's also um, responsive. And so it will be in line as opposed to next to it, uh, next to each other. So it will um, also work on your phone. And then um, it also will allow you to navigate among your, um, your various files dynamically. So, pretty cool tool. In the open source world, this makes sense, right? Because you're open source, you're looking <coughs> open source. There's also a tool called JS Doc that gives you something a little bit more like what you're used to when you're generating API documentation with um, certain types of variables, essentially, like certain types of directives inside your comments. You can give it things like you know parameter types and, and things like that. So, documentation, pretty important. Is it previous app just grok.js? Yeah, G-R-O-C. And then once we're running in a real browser, there are a few things we probably want to do. 
Um, I pronounce this muscula. I have no idea how to pronounce this actually, but it is um, it's something that I believe has been a hole in the client side JavaScript world for quite some time now. Does anybody have a system in place that would let them know uh, without a user telling them that they have JavaScript errors on their website? Okay, so a few people are doing it. I think it's probably homegrown. Um, this is a tool that does it for you, and it's free right now. I think it's it's still in beta, but um, awesome. Uh, check it out. Um, script tabs at the bottom. You guys know to do that. Yeah. Just want to make sure that's out there. Um, only a few JS files. So you're writing lots of JavaScript. You're separating your files out. You're testing them, making them testable. Now, how do you take that down to a few files? Well, there are a few ways to do that. Now we get into the world of modules. You may have heard the term. Um, there's two types of modules primarily in the JavaScript world. One is CommonJS. What you're seeing at the top is CommonJS, and that's how you would write um, Node. Right? If you're writing a module in the Node world, that's what it looks like. So module.exports, and we're using the require statement, and that's a synchronous statement. Right? So you don't have to wait for a callback on that. And truly, in the Node world, um, that is a synchronous read off disk situation. Right? So be aware of that. Uh, in the AMD world, you have a defined statement where you give it your dependencies in, an, in a list, and then you pass in a callback that will get all of those dependencies passed in. And uh, that is the, module, the model that I like because that can be run directly in the browser using something called require.js. So the great thing about require.js is that it um, works without a build step. Um, unfortunately, you have to put boilerplate in every file and you have to change the way you do things in your files. Um, especially if you're sharing code on the client and on the server, like I do with Node.js, you have to put extra boilerplate code into, your, um, into the top of your files. Browserify is another um, Node command line tool which will take a set of CommonJS modules and package them up into one file that can be used on the client side. Um, and it stubs out some standard Node.js stuff for you, so you're not going to break out of hand if you're using some standard Node paradigms. Um, but I don't really like it because um, I don't like running a build step before I get things into my browser. Um, there's a noticeable delay, like I like to like, make a change and refresh really fast, and um, require.js will do that for me. And then I just have to mention Google Closure. I've only played with this one, but um, the promise is pretty amazing they uh, will actually parse your code and they will prune code that it believes you will not be able to call ever. And that, um, I mean, there's this idyllic world that I have in my head that I could use jQuery and it would know exactly what parts of jQuery I actually needed because it just feels so big, you know? But um, I recently looked at custom builds in jQuery and there's nothing I can really take out that would have a big effect, so nah, that's just a dream. Um, all right. So, um, I mentioned dependency injection. It's probably worth talking about just a little bit. Um, this is how I do it. It's kind of poor man's dependency injection in the Node world or in the JavaScript world. Question yes. About the closure compiler. Is that is that something where you can mark like this is our application, this is jQuery, and it's saying removing everything, or is it just taking one file? It attempts to, well, okay, first of all, as far as I understand it, you have to concatenate everything. Um, as far as I understand it, you have to concatenate everything. All right. Right? Which means that um, it's using one file. And it's like the world is that one file. And I don't do things that way. I don't have one file that I send down to my web clients. So, but it's pretty awesome um, if, you can, if you can do your development in that world. So I'd, I would recommend you at least check it out, play with it for an afternoon. So dependency injections. Um, if I want to test this this uh, obj class, and I want to not go to the database, then I could just pass in the database, right? And then it could do it up. Or if I'm using a service, I could just pass in the service. Or it turns out I could just do something like this. Oh, actually, that's not. Oh, here we go. Editable? No, it's not editable. Um, I could just do obj or a new up an option, then go dot service and change that, right? Because JavaScript allows you to change anything, right? But um, service locator is something that if you're getting really serious and enterprisey, you might want to use. Um, 
So it's just not that common in the JavaScript world. Um, Angular, though, actually does it, and it's pretty intense. Like, I don't know, if, if, how many people have tried Angular, or like, played with it? Um, yeah, it's all about dependency injection, it's all about testability, and you, you know, you can request um, a certain type of class, and it will, it'll, you know, do a factory style create for you on it, right? So they're trying to go there, um, and there are other people experimenting with it. If you pull that down this, this slide set, you can take a look at some other people that are playing with it. I haven't found it necessary yet, but maybe at some point I will. All right. Okay, so, whew. all right, now, <laughs> we have now made a, ourselves a little uh, nest in which we can write some code, right? We have our test harness, we have our module system, we have our libraries pulled down, everything. But, how well do you know JavaScript? So let's dig into this. All right, uh, I think I'm hinting pretty well at what this does based on how I'm organizing this, but, um, Take note, what is, what is this going to do? Yeah, so um, I didn't try to trick you by having, <laughs> you know, uh, groups that don't make sense together, but as you can see, null and undefined, false, false. Um, when you're checking if that's false, obviously false. Zero and empty string are also coming back falsy. Those are kind of interesting, and not a number comes back as falsy. And then uh, a valid reference to something like f, or one, the number, or uh, a string that is non-empty or true, right? So that's an interesting bit of uh, knowledge first. There's, you can do just if um, something and get some meaning out of that. Um, and so people use falsy and, and, or truthiness and falsy all the time in JavaScript. So it's just a, it's a good uh, bit of knowledge to know what happens. So triple equals versus double equals. Uh, this one is, like, it trips up anybody coming from the Java world or the c -sharp world immediately, right? You're just used to double, double equals. So, um, this one is the key, right? The, the A, op, or a um, key in that O object is an integer, and it does not equal, triple equals, zero of the string. But all those other comparisons work. Uh, I also direct your attention to equal equal null. So here we set a equal to null, which means the key exists on the object, but it's not uh, a value, it's null. And so that double equals works. And then when we delete it off the object, right? So I don't know if you guys know you can do this, but in JavaScript, when you have an object, it's a hash of things, you can delete one of the hashes, and it's not even a key anymore on that object, right? And so that also double equals null. So a double equals null check is usually okay for things. Um, and I generally, if I'm dealing with anything but a number, I usually just do if the variable because um, that's, that works for most situations. But um, yeah, so triple equals versus double. So functions are objects in JavaScript. Um, so first of all, we're gonna new up a function. Right, so that's the anonymous syntax. You're used to using that if you're writing your jQuery in an untestable way. <laughs> um, so we can type of, actually let's just run this, then we can go over the results. So it's a type of function, and when we print it out, funny enough, it actually allows us to see what's in the function, which is kind of interesting. And I've seen some things online take advantage of this. Um, and then we can get its arity by checking f.length. And so to prove that that works, let's just do this. And so now we get two. We can actually set an op, uh, a, a, a param or a key on the object of the function and do things with that. And you'll see a lot of libraries do that. Like they return an object, but you can actually use properties on that thing and then you can call it two and it's, it doesn't make any sense, right? But that's how they do it. Um, and you'll note that here, with the function, we can pass in more parameters than it takes, and that works. And then you can print out this arguments thing. And arguments is a very powerful keyword, obviously. You don't have to declare all the, all the arguments, and your arity is zero, but you can still stu do stuff with the, um, the, the arguments. So it's, it's a little funky, right? But it allows you to do some really interesting stuff. And then call and apply allow you to uh, explicitly take 
say an array of your arguments and pass that in, or just um, list them out as the parameter list. Right? So you can start seeing how you can compose some interesting stuff with all of these basic tools. So any questions on this? This is when it starts getting a little tricky. Well, it's just, Question. Um, functions are objects. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. Um, so, yes, hold your horses on the this. We'll get there. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So context. That's one of the most interesting things about JavaScript is you can use a parent context's variable. Okay? So at the top level, again, we'll run this. At the top level, we set a to 1. We declare a variable here, f that returns a function that takes something, okay? So we have A, B, and C, and we print them all out. And then at the top level, we call F, and F is, is this top level one, and we're getting another function back, right? Because again, functions are objects, and you can just new them up. And then we call that with three. And so the C comes from this call, the B comes from that, which was done on the line above, and the A comes from here. And if we do that again, you can prove that out, right? Four is the second call. And then in the, the third call, we, read, we change the value of A. And that comes out. So this thing is still referring back to this. And we can even return this function out of this, this um, context to some other caller. And it can still have access to that variable. right? So we're retaining a pointer to the parent context. So that gets. Again, really powerful, also a little tricky when you're trying to figure out what's happening. Um, <laughs> right, moving on. So uh, JavaScript is single threaded. That's true both in Node and on the browser. And you should know that in the browser, that is on the UI thread, right? So if you're doing an infinite loop, you're not gonna come back from that. There's no interactivity left. Um, I heard something about Opera doing something a little more intelligent. Um, it will actually still be responsive if you do something crazy like that. But uh, so what we're going to do here is we are going to set two intervals up that are uh, incrementing x and decrementing x, and we're going to run them as fast as we can, pretty much, and then we're only going to let them go for 250 milliseconds. So, you know, I guess I was somewhat surprised that these are done exactly in order. Um, that's just consistent. But, you know, that's not atomic. It's simply that we only run one of these um, event handlers at a time. Right? So you don't have to worry about locking, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And it actually makes things a lot easier in the Node.js world, right? I mean, if you're, if you're in C-sharp, you're like writing a, uh, a log, um, a logging library, and it's being called from all sorts of different threads, right? And that is just not fun, right? iOS, also not fun. Um, we have to be a little careful, right? Because if you do some sort of big bit of computation in the browser, you won't be responsive. And that's where web workers come in, it's, a, it's a, not an easy API because you don't get access to the same memory context. If you want to use that stuff, you also have to be aware of which browsers support it. So yeah. if, if it's truly in a separate context, how do you communicate between them? Essentially, you marshal a specific object over, right? When you instantiate a web worker, you have to marshal something over to it, and you marshal it back when you're done. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> Okay, so prototype inheritance. So I know a lot of you guys um, may have seen this. I know I was afraid of it for a long time. So let's take a look at what this does. So this is where this starts coming in. So this is just a function statement, right, with a named function. And uh, it uses this in it. It then assigns to prototype, which is a special object in JavaScript, the f function, and that again uses this.a. We then declare a sub, right, so we're gonna sub that. <coughs> we call it, and so call is coming back again, so again, this is a function and we're calling it with this context, right, so this object, we're calling that function on ourselves, right, and we're passing in options, so, when people are newing up a sub, they're essentially newing up a super at the same time because we're calling it. And then this is the most interesting line. What we're doing here is we're 
creating a duplicate of the of super's prototype object, which gives us access to all of its prototype functions. And then we're setting the constructor to ourselves, right? So it's a, it, we're mixing these two things. And so when we run this, this dot f console logs a, it's super because we passed in super here. When we new up sub, we're calling f, which was defined on super. And we're getting the console log again, but with a different value because it was passed in by this, right? This constructor, which took options, passed it in here, which comes here, and then finally assigned there. And then this is the really interesting thing about prototypes is you can change them after instantiation of an object of that prototype, right? So sub.prototype.g, we console log that, and indeed there it was, right? We call that out. So um, I do like to do objects in JavaScript. I like to be object oriented. That's how I was trained in uh, computer science, right? Java, um, then C sharp on the C sharp team at Microsoft, and then um, yeah, also like C plus plus. Like I like objects, right? But um, I had a question. Yes, yes. Regarding that, you know, because I have also tried, you know, like many years ago. There was a problem with the state of the art of browsers by then. Right, right. Performance. And something I started wondering myself, in my case was, uh, did I really have that degree of, let's say, inheritance and high quality object oriented uh, design, or was that, that something that I wanted to feel like I wasn't using Java, if I was using it more Java? So you're, you're wondering if it's something you just want to feel good about versus new? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't care. I, I need emotional support for my language. Um, but yeah, fair enough. Like you don't need it. You don't need it. But um, I do like what I like about the objects is they retain state, and they make that state available to users. When you um, do a standard um, closure-based system where you have a bunch of local variables, you return an object that's referring to all those local variables. None of those variables will ever be able to be accessed again, and you can never change them, and they're not testable, right? So that's why I like objects because your your state is available to your user. What do you there's no concurrency in JavaScript. Okay, uh, we have a lot more to get through. Um, I will absolutely be available in the future indefinitely to answer these questions, but we need to get through this. Okay, so getters and centers. You didn't think those were possible in JavaScript, huh? Well, they are. Um, define property, get set, done and done, right? Here we go, let's run this. Okay, so when we access the property, it's computed, right? We run that function. And when we set something to the property, it sets it to value, which we can then access, right? So we can do getters and setters. That's kind of cool. Um, now, there was a mention here, like the browser state of the art wasn't quite there when I was trying to do it, but there were performance issues. Well, it's true, these are ES5 features, which means we don't get all of this support in every browser. Oh no. <laughs> That was so nice. I liked using that syntax. Well, um, there are tools online to help us understand how bad it is. Um, this is a, such a great table because it, it describes how I feel about these browsers. <laughs> yeah, like that's not awesome and not awesome. Also, really not awesome. Um, and then, can I use also is very useful in that it tells us how many people are using each of these things, right? So yeah, and also not awesome, right? So yeah, that's like it's like. 8% of the web in, uh, in red, right? And another 5% of the web in orange? That's, yeah, that's not cool, right? So, whew, yeah, all is not lost. Polyfills to the rescue. Um, I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but there are absolutely ways to write modern JavaScript on browsers that are old, right? And um, yeah, HTML5 please is a great site, right? Because <laughs> it, uh, you know, the please in there just, that describes how I feel when I when I uh, didn't have solutions for this stuff. Um, and then there's another solution to that. Um, once you're starting to like build in some shims, you know, some polyfills, and once you're starting to um, you know do some specific checks on those browsers, you want to probably pull in the actual browsers. And so test tools, Karma and Testum are awesome. They will automate your browsers. They will on the machine in question. They will connect to the browser and they will run your code in it. 
It's pretty awesome. And then there are services like cross-browser testing, browser stack, and et cetera, et cetera. That link, many more, link, li links to like you know 20 of these things. And so uh, we'll get to that. Um, the, you could very easily set up a single page that runs all your tests and then shows you yes or no at the end, right? And then send it to these services, right? Really easy. Um, but Karma and Testum are a little more advanced and you can set them up to even watch things on disk, right? The demo for Karma, um, when you change a file on disk, it sends it to you know, the browsers in question and gives you the results immediately, right? So pretty awesome. So what do you use when you got servers and your server's just got a text window interface, no X windows interface? A server? You don't, you can't run. Oh, right, right, okay, so you have like a build server, right? You have a headless build server, right? So first of all, um, you can use PhantomJS if you're really headless, but like, let's be honest, like, uh, if you're really worried about this stuff, then you should either move all the way back to something that IE8 supports, if that's in your user set. Like, make sure to never use anything that IE8, IE8 doesn't support, well, like or do I some testing. I use an iMac for, you know, it's right there, I can develop in that world. But then I've got like eight Linux servers that I work with too, so like. Right, well, fundamentally, like, you can decide to take the risk of, you know, not running in the browser itself. You can decide to take that risk. Right, like you know, these are pretty well tested shims, but you know, there's no guarantee per perfectly exactly, and there's potentially also performance issues um, on old browsers with some of this JavaScript. Right, so you probably want to test that. Um, happily, some of these browsers are slowly the usage is going down, but um, it, you know, you guys are aware of how the cost of supporting these old browsers if you're running CSS as well. Super painful. Okay, so back to the code. This, the question was asked, how, does, how do we deal with this? Like, that's a weird keyword. It behaves strangely. So we create a new object. <coughs> On its construction, it sets this.x equals to seven. The f function prints that out. So we create a new one, we print it out, we get seven. We pull that, that function out. We set it to a top level variable and we call it raw. What do we get? We get undefined. Right, because this is undefined. Or I should say, actually, in that case, this is uh, probably the global object. But um, yeah, when we call, when we do a g.call though, um, we can pass in the value of this. So again, this is like when we were doing the, cons on construction, we were doing an, a call, right? And then we can do a bind, where forevermore, whenever we call g, it will be bound to this. And that's the service that we get from underscore and load. And then, uh, the last line. Okay, now we're gonna start get, getting into weird stuff with JavaScript. Some of the tricky parts of JavaScript. So, you forget the new when you instantiate it with your objects. What happens? Well, first of all, you don't get an object back anymore. Right, that's undefined. And then, well, okay, that, that variable just came out of nowhere. Uh, x, right, x, x is seven, and that's because in straight JavaScript, if you forget the new, this is the global object, right? Or it's the current context. Okay, so that's not awesome. That's not good, we do not like that. Which brings us to strict mode. I recommend each and every one of you use it. All right, so let's try and run this. No duplicate parameter names, okay? So what you know, first let's, let's make sure that this thing runs normally. And indeed it does, no errors, okay? Let's just go through some of the weird things in this. Oops. Okay, so the first error is no duplicate parameter names. Yeah, that's, that, that would not work in code, right? We can't do that. And the next is duplicate data property. Yeah, again, like that doesn't make any sense. Okay, strict mode, no width. Yeah, width, okay, we didn't like that anyway. And apologies for the lack of syntax highlighting there. Octal literals. Yeah, we probably didn't mean that to be an octal number. <laughs> and can't set property x of undefined. Now this is where it gets interesting. That solves the problem we just saw. This.x equals seven. We didn't do a new, and it's undefined. This is undefined, which gets up, gives us that error. It's a runtime error. We put the new in, and it works. Um, this one is behaving strangely because of eval, apologies. 
<clears throat> and uh, object up prototype. <laughs> if you were to do that in your code, thing, bad, very bad things would happen. So what it does is it prevents you from doing that, but it fails silently. Like it does not break your code if you do this in your code. Um, strict mode will make you fail, which again, if you're testing your code, you'll then find out you're doing these stupid things. <laughs> so let's get rid of that. And again, now we're, we're uh, passing again. So strict mode. Strict mode support is not supported in every browser, but the point is, if you test in browsers that do support it, you'll be prevented from doing those bad things and not do the bad things in the browsers that don't support it. Question? Yes, if, you're, if you have used strict at the top of all your files and then you concatenate your files, is that going to be a problem or if you are mixing? I would heavily, heavily recommend that you never manually concatenate your files. Yeah, well, if you, <laughs> even if you concatenate them with a tool, um, is it going to cause problems to have used strict in the middle of there? And right, so the scope of strict mode is an interesting one to talk about. Um, it's inside of a function, it's at the top of every function, right? You can do it inside any function. And you can also do it at the top of a file. I would absolutely recommend that you're always wrapping things or using tools that wrap things for you. So I use require.js, again, there's that define and a function, right? That's where I put my use strict so I don't interfere with other stuff. But you're right, absolutely. That's a great issue. If you're manually concatenating things and you're not wrapping, then your scope is leaking anyway, and the use strict will mess up other people's code if they are doing stupid things like that. Okay, so strict, strict mode support, again, yeah, not everywhere. Um, all right, so yeah, yeah, JavaScript has some strict, tricky, tricky parts. Um, JS Hint. I love this tool. It saves my life all the time. Use it. It will catch undefined variable usage. It will tell you about unused variables so you don't have to have them in your code. It will tell you if you're using double equals. It will say, do you, do you really mean triple equals? It will tell you about your cyclomatic complexity of your code to tell you if you're jamming too much functionality in one function. We know Seattle software craftsmanship. Yeah? Yeah, we don't put a lot of functionality in one function. OK. Uh, for yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 all right. Um, it will verify invitation if you really care about that stuff. So these last bits are um, kind of helping your team conform to the same standard, right? And uh, the original writer of JS Lint, which JS Hint is based off of, actually said he wanted it to be a pain in the ass for developers. Um, but it's a good thing because your code ends up better, right? Um, then there's complexity report.js, um, maintainability metric. And this is pretty advanced stuff. It actually looks at how many um, comments you have in your code, how complex the code is, and it'll tell you how maintainable your code is. And the best way to use it, because the output is kind of crap if you just use it directly, is to uh, use a grunt task. Which brings us to grunt, which is a great, great tool. Uh, project automation. Uh, available today, easily downloadable. Um, tasks for JS Hint, Mocha, um, concatenating, minifying your files, and then a watch, a generic watch task, which based on when certain files change, it'll run arbitrary tasks for you. Um, super awesome, I was using it for this because I wrote it in Jade, and then compiled the Jade to my HTML, and every time I made a change in the Jade and saved it out, it generated the HTML for me. All right, so pretty awesome stuff. And then when you're writing your own tasks, you have some sort of custom build system. Um, you, you need to make, do some sort of custom transformation for your project. It has a very powerful API. Like, if you have ever written code to search for files in directory tree in JavaScript, so you wrote some sort of tool to do that, um, you can now delete all that code and rely on Grunt to do it for you because it does advanced globbing, right? So double star will uh, match a number of uh, levels of hierarchy for files. So very cool stuff. And then there are tasks that's available and then you could also write them yourself to plug into Jenkins and Travis CI for your um, continuous integration. So you can run in. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, that's how I do it. Let me just show you real quick. Uh, so this is my, one of my projects. So I type grope mocha cub, like it's a, a code coverage mocha tool. Um, and I tell it to use my interactive configuration. And then I tell it to uh, search for the test that's, that has tests in it. And then that gives me this file or this page. Of, Oh, uh, you know what? It's like pulling something down from the internet. Uh, it hasn't loaded yet. Come on. 
you know, for having 8 gigs of RAM, I'm disappointed at the performance of this thing sometimes, or maybe it's just the apps I'm using. But yeah, so it just pulled this up, and this is actually doing some round tripping with my server. This is Mocha, and this is what Mocha looks like in your browser. And then this is what um, Blanket looks like in the browser too, right? So I have both code coverage and required, it's required JS, it's super sexy. I happily show it to you. I don't think that's the scope of this talk. Um, but yeah, run, use it. All right, so yeah, that was, like, if you remember all that stuff, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so, um, Yeoman, uh, if you are new to this stuff, just do, type those commands. npm install dash g yo and generate a web app. Make dir, do whatever you want, do it wherever you want, you use the current directory, and then yo web app, it will generate a grunt based file watching live reload require JS using unit testable system using phantom JS. It's freaking phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. If you have not used it, you should use it. If only to learn from how it configures things, then you can take some of those things into your project. Um, like, I spent way too much time uh, configuring my own stuff uh, after looking at how they do things. Like, it's pretty great. Like, it's best practices for the open source world. Like, if only to learn how they do things, take a look. It's pretty awesome. And there are a lot of other generators too. It's not just web app. Um, no matter the technology, you can probably find it in there. And if not, they have a pretty good API for generating. So, um, the JavaScript ecosystem is awesome. The JavaScript language has some questionable things, fair enough, but uh, JS Hint and some other tools make it better. And uh, I recommend that you try Node.js because you can use all these learnings on the server too. Thank you very much for paying attention. Okay, so what I forgot to say is that you're probably the one person I've met who knows more about JavaScript than I think anyone I've ever met before. <laughs> I'm really impressed. Um, now you also, you, you do your software contract, right? I do, so, I do. So if someone wanted to hire you to write some JavaScript or write some rocket ship stuff to you, right? That's you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Do you do training too? Uh, not yet, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 love, I love teaching people. So, you know, startup weekend, talks like this. You know, the Seattle JS, I'll happily um, show up to just mentor people, so I don't need to talk, but I'll just like help people one on one. And so, like, ask me any questions you have. It's awesome stuff. Well, thank you very much for being here. That was great. That was awesome. <laughs> and I want to thank all you guys for being here, too, because without you in those seats and Scott here, I mean, we just have an empty building. So, thank you guys for being here, for being a part of what we're doing. Uh, socialize, make friends, make mentors, make have a good time, and uh, thank you guys. We'll see you in January. Or, and we'll see you at uh, Code Camp. <laughs> Bye. Bye.